son was named one son was named Herbert Jr. and the other one was named Alan. Well, Mr. Hoover had returned to West Branch a couple of times before, uh, one being a trip in 1923 for the dedication of the new schoolhouse. But this trip was going to be very special because now he was the Republican nominee for the highest elected position in the United States, the presidency. Well, for Herbert Hoover and Lou Henry Hoover, the old hometowns were West Branch and Waterloo, respectively. Herbert Clark Hoover had been born in the Cedar County village of West Branch on a warm August 10th, 1874. And he was the son of Jesse and Hulda Mint Minthorn Hoover, and their modest two-room cottage house was on the south edge of West Branch. Uh, Jesse was a blacksmith, strong in body, fun-loving in spirit with a chuckling laugh, and also just beginning to deal in selling reapers and threshers to the farm population. His wife and Herbert Hoover's mother was Hulda, a housewife and former teacher described by some as an attractive, with dark brown hair and serious gray eyes, efficient and seriously pious woman with a good mind who claimed the Quaker church as her strength. Some mentioned her dark brown hair and serious gray eyes. A sadness entered the Hoover household when both Jesse and Hulda died within a few years of each other and their three children, Theodore, who was often called Tad, Herbert, and Mary, who was usually called May, were orphaned. Not yet a teenager, Herbert Hoover later left West Branch and was sent to live with relatives in Oregon. Now, Lou Henry Hoover, the daughter of Charles and Florence Weed Henry, had left her birth city in Waterloo in Blackhawk County as just a young lady of 11 years. And during those early years, she was remembered as a carefree youngster who loved being outdoors and riding horses. Her father, Charles, a businessman and bookkeeper cashier for the First National Bank in Waterloo, had chosen to take his family to California in hopes of greater opportunities. Her mother, Florence, was a homemaker. Mrs. Hoover was eager to see Iowa friends on this trip and relatives and to see the changes that had taken place in Waterloo. During their, their three and about half days in Iowa in 1928, the Hoovers were in West Branch. They journeyed to a, a, a short stop in Iowa City. They stayed in Cedar Rapids at Bruce Moore and uh, then Lou Henry Hoover and the two sons went up to Waterloo for a day. Um, now, Hoover would later become the first president born west of the Mississippi River. And uh, he was a Democrat, he, he ran against the Democratic nominee who was Governor Al Smith uh, from the Lower East Side of Manhattan, New York. Now, for the two boys, uh, Herbert and Allen, uh, this visit to Iowa after the exciting Kansas City Republican Convention was a chance to see the people and places their parents had described to them over the years. And both Al Herbert Jr., who was 25 at the time, and Alan, who was 21, were at the beginnings of their careers. Uh, Herbert Jr. already had a degree from Stanford University in engineering. He had gotten that in 1925. He was married. And Alan was a college student. The sons were really looking forward to not only seeing the Iowa sites, excuse me, but also meeting some of the people their parents had known years before. For Alan, the younger son, this was his first trip to the Hawkeye State, while Herbert Jr. had been twice previously, the most recent one when he was 17 years old. And this is the house, the homestead house. And as I described it before, this is the area in which Herbert Hoover was born, right here. And they had added on uh, these two, um, this two-story home to it. Um, Mrs. Skellers was a widow, and uh, for uh, for some time, five, six, seven years before. She had actually been selling tickets for people to come and visit the house and advertised it as such. I think she charged 10 cents in order to come in. Um, later, Alan, the son that I just mentioned that was still in college at the time of the 1928 visit, 
managed to purchase this. Mrs. Skellers would not sell it, but when she died, they purchased it. They tore down and removed the two-story. They turned this building around, and that's the cottage that we know today. And here is uh, Mr. Hoover, President Hoover, and uh, his wife, Lou Henry Hoover. And here is the family I mentioned. This is uh, on the left is uh, Herbert Jr. And this is Herbert Hoover and uh, his wife, Lou. And this is Alan. Now, Alan is an interesting guy because he, this was his first trip, but he really kind of fell in love with the story of his father's humble beginnings. And Alan, when he died years later, actually bought a plot here in West Branch and he's buried there. Two of his children are already deceased and they're also buried uh, in West Branch. So Herbert Hoover came from generations in West Branch and now two generations have followed uh, the, the father and grandfather. It's really a handsome uh, family, isn't it? Mrs. Skellers had given uh, Lou these um, flowers as a little gift. They had breakfast in his birthplace in the kitchen of the building. She also gave a, a gift to uh, Mr. Hoover of a cane, a hand carved cane um, with a ear of corn on the top of it. During their celebration here, they used a lot of, of uh, corn symbolism too. Now this is Lou as a child, and I've got another story about that because one of my first books was called uh, Clear Lake, The Earliest Images. And researchers will enjoy hearing this story, I think. Um, I was writing about Clear Lake in the 1870s and 1880s. And as Elaine said, I have a large stereograph collection and a lot of the stereographs were taken during uh, those decades in Clear Lake. It was kind of a vacation spot and people wanted to take home the double photoed image and put them in a stereoscope. And then the two uh, images emerge and it creates a, a three-dimensional, a kind of like the view masters of, of my generation. Well, I had the book pretty well put together, but I was just lacking one thing. And that one thing I was lacking was a lot of people came in from other towns in the area and they camped. And I wanted somewhere to find something that told me about what camping was like um, at Clear Lake in 1875. Well, I knew my chances were probably limited, but um, I did talk around a little bit. And I found out that a man had contacted the Clear Lake Public Library and he said he had uh, kind of a, a diary or an article or something dealing with somebody that had camped at Clear Lake during that time. And I was really excited uh, because I was eager to see it. Well, fortune smiled on me because it happened to be an article written by Lou Henry Hoover, um, the former first lady of, of the United States. Uh, so I could include that in, in uh, my research. And I was uh, really happy to have it. And before Grant did the final painting, The Birthplace of Herbert Hoover, he did this sketch. And he, um, you can see it looks very uh, similar, doesn't it? Uh, the biggest change is that he has put an insert right down here. And that insert shows the cottage as it was um, when uh, the Hoovers owned it. You can see there are some differences. Um, and with the original painting, um, there was a story that um, Mr. Hoover was shown the painting, uh, the finished painting on Masonite board. And they, there were some businessmen in Des Moines that thought maybe they would purchase it for him from Grant Wood. But Grant kind of suspected uh, that Herbert Hoover might not like this. Um, and sure enough, when they presented it to, to Mr. Hoover, he said, no, he said, 
Um, well, the, the, orig the uh, finalized painting didn't include this, but he said to the people, that wasn't the place I was born. That, that doesn't look anything like it. And I don't want people thinking that it did. Now, part of that was a political reasoning, I think, because um, Mr. Hoover learned early on that the idea in Americans' minds that a person could come from such humble beginnings and be elected the president of the United States was an image that he wanted to preserve. He wanted people to think, uh, and this looks too nice. I mean, it looks like it's a nice house in a nice neighborhood with nice lawns. And he just wasn't interested in that. So um, uh, it was, it came up for sale and it was uh, bought by um, Gardner Cowles of Des Moines. Uh, he was a publisher of Look Magazine and he sold it years later to Ralph Blum of Beverly Hills. And then later on, it was uh, purchased uh, by a couple in New York. Um, and uh, they left it to one of their sons who uh, put it eventually um, uh, on loan to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, but evidently it came on sale in, in 1982 and, and did come back to the Midwest, which I'm really happy for. Now that this one, the brown uh, wrapping uh, preliminary drawing or sketch, uh, in 1947, uh, that was, this was uh, inherited by Nan Wood Graham. And in 1947, um, she offered to sell uh, this uh, wrapping paper um, depiction um, to an Iowa uh, City friend, and he was a former publisher of the Iowa City Press Citizen. His name was Ed Green. And Nan said to Ed, don't take it unless you want it. Uh, well, he did take it. And now, um, upon Ed's death, uh, it was uh, bequeathed to the University of Iowa Art Building, that, which will be the new Stanley Museum of Art in Iowa City. And its value, of course, is probably six figures or so, if not more. Uh, the, this preliminary sketch was done on charcoal, chalk, and pencil, um, and it was given to the university in 1985. Um, he had owned it since it had, he had purchased it um, from Nan Wood Graham in 1947. Uh, now, the university does have other works uh, by Grant Wood, plaid sweater, some of you know that one, uh, and a couple of his European paintings, along with most of his uh, lithographs. And back to the original painting. And I'll give you a little history behind this too. Um, the birthplace of Herbert Hoover by Grant Wood, um, as I said, was done before restoration uh, took place. But a book came out in 1944 um, by uh, Darl Garwood, and he made some comments about this in his book, Artist in Iowa, A Life of Grant Wood. Now, at the time of publication, Garwood had told people he was doing research, I think for a magazine article in South America. So that gave him access to a lot of people uh, that had known Grant Wood. Um, then he turned around and published a book. And a lot of them were mad because they thought uh, Park Reinert, uh, who was Grant Wood's secretary, was going to do the official uh, autobiography. And as I've told some of you before, uh, Nan Wood's copy of uh, Darrell Dar Garwood's um, book, A Life of Grant Wood, if you see it, it's at the State Historical Society here in Iowa City. And Nan has just ripped it apart. She, she'll say, this never happened. I've, I've never heard of this before, this, you know, this and that. So one has to be careful when they read uh, Garwood's book. Um, and I would always suggest to researchers that they go to the State Historical Society and look at, uh, at the comments that uh, Nan Wood has made in, in, uh, in the book too. At any rate, uh, this is what he wrote. He said, Herbert Hoover was about to come up uh, for election and the house in which he was born stood only 35 
minutes southeast of Cedar Rapids at West Branch. Grant painted birthplace of Hoover, Herbert Hoover in fall clutters, colors with flaring trees, a frame house, and a concrete highway over which a dark shade was cast. The Hoover family's trees full of banana-like curves. In this and other landscapes, he achieved a humorous effect with odd exaggerations, which still strike a familiar note. It was said of birthplace of Herbert Hoover that when it was shown around Iowa, it attracted bigger crowds than Hoover himself, which was no great accomplishment in 1931, because as you all know, the depression was, was taking place and many people blamed Herbert Hoover for the uh, depression. But when the president saw the painting, he complained that it was too glorified. Only the back half of the house was there when he was born, he said. There was a dirt road in front of it and the place hadn't looked as well kept as a private golf club. Grant had rearranged, heightened, stylized, and tailored. As one farmer told him after looking at the painting, yep, that's the place all right. And we sure want to thank you for cutting all the weeds. Well, in my brother, Grant Wood, by Nan, uh, Grant's sister, Nan, uh, she also commented on uh, birthplace of Herbert Hoover. And this is what she said. On one Sunday, our cousins, Ralph and Stella Coney Bear, took us for a ride and we visited President Herbert Hoover's birthplace at West Branch, Iowa. Grant decided that later he would do a painting of it. And so he made a preliminary charcoal drawing on brown wrapping paper. The cabin in which Mr. Hoover was born had been nearly swallowed up by a later two-story addition. In one corner of the paper, Grant made a small drawing of the cabin without the addition. In the 1931 painting, Birthplace of Herbert Hoover, Grant deleted the cabin in the corner, replacing it with a cluster of oak leaves. In both the drawing and the painting, a man points to the house and the creek in which the president swam as a boy in the foreground. The painting had art circles puzzled. They couldn't decide whether Grant was glorifying or satirizing President Hoover. Considering the artist, most of them decided it was satire. Years later, Grant's friend Bruce McKay wrote, Grant liked the funny trees and Chuck Clark standing out in front. Later, the Hoover family commissioned my firm to restore the house and grounds to the original form with a two room, one story cottage. Grant, an ardent new dealer, used to chuckle and say that I was changing his picture. However, he didn't feel it hurt the painting. McKay was right about Grant's political sentiments However, my brother admired both Birthplace Cottage and Herbert Hoover personally. Now in that, he mentioned, uh, Nan mentions that she, uh, Grant and the Connie Bears uh, made a little trip out. Well, let me tell you just who the Connie Bears were. Um, the wife, uh, Frances Connie Bear, had been born in Anamosa and had lived in Cedar Rapids her entire life. She was part of the Weaver family, which was Grant's mother's family. And when she got married to Ralph Connie Bear uh, in 1913, Grant was actually the best man in the wedding. Um, and I found one reference to Mr. and Mrs. F.L. Weaver coming from Omaha in a touring car. Um, now, also some, another area that needs to be well-researched is the Weaver family because uh, the, the family that came in from Omaha, uh, the brother of Hattie uh, Wood was a very prosperous um, lawyer in Omaha. And yet Hattie and her family were destitute several times. So that whole Weaver connection would be interesting. And Hattie also uh, had a sister uh, living in Cedar Rapids at time, as well as her mother and father when she moved to the city after uh, being widowed. Now the man right here, uh, his name, the model's name actually was Charles Clark. We know that 
And Charles Clark lived on Beaver Avenue Southeast in, in Iowa City, or I'm sorry, in Cedar Rapids. Um, and once it said that uh, one time when uh, he was a good friend, and in fact, I found another newspaper that said, uh, uh, it's at Grant Wood, J. Sigmund, Fred Safety, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Clark, and Mr. and Mrs. Van Vechen Schaefer were guests at the new Saturday Luncheon Club at Iowa City Saturday through the courtesy of Professor John T. Frederick. So they were all friends, they, they all ran together. Um, one time, in fact, uh, Grant had, uh, I found that it had been recorded that uh, uh, Charles Clark, uh, this man was trying to sell a house in Cedar Rapids or to rent a house, I guess. And Grant uh, heard about that and he decided that he would recommend uh, using an advertising slogan that was with a goldfish in every room. And so Clark, this man, got enough 10 cent store goldfish to justify the advertisement and it rented the house. So weird idea came about in this way. Nan had a goldfish that would eat from her hand and Grant spent a great deal of time watching it. So the, when the problem of renting a house came up, uh, he put the two things together. Now here's a little detail. And you know, I mentioned, well here you can see the birthplace of Herbert Hoover. And I mentioned the fire hydrant, which I think this is what this is in 1931. And then this, and at first I thought that might be like a traffic marker, but actually this is a stone and it's still there. It's still in uh, West Branch. And uh, it was uh, given by, I think the daughters of the American Revolution or, or some such group um, in honor of that being the site of the uh, birthplace of, of Herbert Hoover. Um, once someone said, uh, to ask Grant too about um, the, the, uh, the painting and saying it didn't look like the birthplace itself. And Grant replied, and I thought this was a good statement. Grant replied, if you wanted to duplicate a thing, you took a camera. But his object was to create a design to heighten effects and to present an idealized version. And the painting was also taken to the Chicago World's Fair in 1933 uh, and was uh, later sold um, in 1948. And here's another, this nicely shows, and I think this is one of the red birds that I mentioned that uh, you can kind of see sitting there. But this shows, I think, the, the strokes um, along the stream that were taken by Grant in the painting. Um, oh, and I should mention too, since we're talking about Grant Wood and Herbert Hoover, uh, when the Hoovers uh, left um, the Midwest after that visit in 1928, the last thing they did before leaving Cedar Rapids was to visit uh, the, uh, win the veterans window, the stained glass window. They wanted to see that uh, before they left town. Um, I also came across an interesting Dear Abby letter that was written by a man who had recently visited Herbert Hoover's birthplace, and this was years later, but he said there was a moon on the outhouse, and uh, Abby then wrote back that the moon was for the ladies, and the star on an outhouse was for the gentlemen. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I found it to be of interest. And this is the cottage, the way it looks today for those of you who are out of state or haven't had a chance to visit. Um, I mentioned that Jesse, the father, was a blacksmith and they've recreated over here uh, a blacksmith shop, but it, it actually faced out on Downey Street that ran by. So it would have been facing the same way as a cottage. And they've done archeological diggings there to confirm that. Today, of course, we kind of promote um, Mr. Hoover as the great humanitarian because he was responsible for, for providing food um, to starving people in Europe after World War I. Uh, they don't talk a lot about his presidency, although many good things were done, but because of the depression, um, uh, he, he's not remembered in that way. He really had the idea that 
any American could pull themselves up by their own bootstraps as he had done and coming from a small town and a small cottage. And of course, President Roosevelt came in with kind of a socialistic a bend to it and uh, thought in a depression, you cannot go back to that idea because there are people out there wanting to work and can't working and can't work. Uh, so he of course created social security and, and uh, a lot of other programs, including the one that Grant Wood worked on at Iowa State in the murals at Iowa State. Um, it was said that when they, when uh, Hoover was not reelected and he rode in the limousine with Mr. Roosevelt to the inauguration, uh, they never spoke um, because their philosophies uh, were so different. Both of them having merits, um, but very different at the time. Now in 1928, so three years before Grant Wood did his painting, a man named Alan Philbrook um, uh, came uh, to West Branch with some of the family members um, and they wanted a, a picture and they wanted it to go to our state government, where, which is where it is. It's in Des Moines right now, Mr. Philbrook's painting. He was from Chicago and was uh, kind of a renowned painter. And here you can see he's painted in the blacksmith shop right here. In, now this, of course, he was looking at the same thing Grant Wood was looking at, but they told him how it should look. And that's, that's what he created. And I thought you might have seen that too. Phil Brook is also the man, and some of you that are from Cedar Rapids have maybe been to a restaurant called Papoli's. It's in the old People's National Bank building. But this is a building that was designed by the famous Chicago architect, Louis Sullivan. And these murals that you see around the top, they were all done by Philbrook. Uh, Philbrook said originally that he didn't want anything to do with a small town bank, calling Cedar Rapids a small town bank um, in Iowa. But when he found out that it was a Louis Sullivan uh, building, then he had more interest in it. I think this is quite interesting right here because if you've looked at dinner for threshers and you've noticed the woman bringing potatoes uh, in to uh, feed the men, looks very similar, doesn't it, um, from that. And as I said, the last thing they wanted to see was the uh, veterans window. They were also quite interested in Iowa City. They uh, viewed the old Capitol that had recently been made into uh, an administrative building for the university. And the West Portico had recently been put up. And the one thing that Lou said afterwards, she said that beautiful winding staircase, that's what she remembered most of all. Well, you know who this is, that's, that's me with my book. And this wonderful statue, I think, of Mr. Hoover is uh, right at the door to the Hoover Elementary School in West Branch. So students uh, that attend the Hoover uh, School uh, can uh, have a, a seat next to Mr. Hoover and feel as if they're getting to know him better that way. Well, that's pretty much what I had for you today. I was, I had told Elaine earlier, I'm quite interested if you have any comments about this particular painting uh, or questions. I'm not an expert on much of anything, uh, certainly not the Hoovers, but um, I hope I've been able to blend enough together there uh, that will give you some thoughts about writing about this particular painting. I really like it. It is one of my favorites along with appraisal and a couple of others, but uh, I think it shows a lot. And if you ever get a chance to go to West Branch, I'd sure encourage you to, um, to take the tour and, and to see what's out there because there's really a lot of history. There's been a new presidential library and um, museum built after uh, Hoover's death. I think it was in, 1964. His burial site, along with Lou, is uh, there also. 
And I just found out today, I talked to the archivist, um, the archives have been closed down all during COVID and they go by national guidelines. So uh, all the presidential libraries, um, they work on the same schedule. Well, I just found out today that the archives will be open um, today and also the gift shop. So I'm, I'm kind of encouraged that I can take out some of these uh, spiral bound books. And if people want one, and if you're listening and live in the area, uh, you can go to the gift shop at the Presidential Library and Museum and, and buy one. Uh, so that's pretty much it. So I'll turn it back over to Elaine. Well, Paul, thank you so much. It was so wonderful. And I'm going to go in order in the chat here because we do have some, some responses and things. So I'm going to go back up to the top, start at the kind of the beginning of the questions here. Uh, first question, Shannon was asking, what did it sell for in 1982? Do you happen to know? I don't know that. I would guess it would be a up over a million dollars, but I, I don't know. I bet um, we, yep. You know, well, there, was a, there was a time in which um, Grant Wood was kind of out of vogue and nobody was really researching him. And about at that about time was when Wanda Korn came in and started to do her research. James Dennis is another one. And they really kind of rediscovered Grant Wood. And the prices really shot up a lot after that time. I don't know exactly what years those were done, but it did make a big difference in, in Grant Wood's work. Well, interesting. It, yeah, maybe, maybe somebody will find that out and, and let us let us know or, or post, post it on the Facebook page, yeah. you know. I would, get, I would guess it's out there somewhere, but I don't know that, Shannon. Um, uh, I like this comment that Steve Hankin put in there that probably the two richest people in West Branch were the blacksmith implement dealer and the banker. Uh, <laughs> so getting over the fact that he was wealthy would be even more difficult if the house were larger. <laughs> Speaking of politics. <laughs> you know, that, that's another way in which there's a comparison between Grant Wood and Herbert Hoover, because both of their dads, as people recall them, were big, tough men. You can imagine a blacksmith man in West Branch uh, shoeing horses and doing all of those things. And uh, for Grant Wood, his dad was the farmer. And of course, both of them didn't follow in their uh, father's footsteps at all and went into a totally different field. So uh, you can see some similarities between these two men, too. Um, and also, Steve, we can count on him for the unexpected detail, uh, commented that the moon on the outhouses stood for Luna, the goddess of the moon, and the star was for men in a world that was not always literate, necessarily. Oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that. Okay, so we've got that happening. Uh, Shannon let us know that there's a Louis Sullivan or Louis Sullivan tour of both Popoli's and United Methodist Church being given on April 2nd from two to four. That's Mark, that's Mark Stouffer Hunter and he's excellent with Cedar Rapids uh, history. So I'd encourage people to look into that. I'm, I'm going to it um, and looking forward to it. You know, when we're talking about outhouses, I just want to, you know me, I my head comes up with some of these, but um, I don't think they've ever excavated the where the outhouse was on the Hoover property. It would be interesting to see because a lot of people threw junk items down there. And I, I went to a lecture one time of a man that did the diggings of these. And what I found of greatest interest was um, he's, he often comes up with false teeth um, in the bottom of the uh, outhouses and down. And of course, people get ill in the house, they're gonna vomit and they run out to the outhouse and they lose their teeth down. Um, it's just an interesting <laughs> little insight because it's something I hadn't thought that you'd ever find false teeth at the bottom of an outhouse, but he did and I saw him, he, he had a, a display of them. Oh goodness. Well, <laughs> okay, so things, things are happening in the chat. Um, Paul, do you have uh, do you have any thoughts about this from Carla? Paul, do you have any thoughts about the skeleton tree in the lower right? No, I hadn't even noticed it. And so, does now 
Now, Carla, were you thinking that it represented something or reminded you of anything or? We'll have to it, unmute it, it, Yeah, un, unmute Carla. <laughs> Oops, we can't, oops we, we can't hear you, Carla. You'll have to start all over. We can't hear you. I don't know, maybe your volume needs to go up. <laughs> uh. There could be some symbolism there. I don't know. We can see what other people think too. I, I don't know. Okay, well, um, let's see. And somebody was, oh, Barb, Barb E was saying that the, the Herbert Hervey Museum is really awesome and the archivist is very knowledgeable, which I'm sure you experienced, Paul. Yeah, that's, his name is Matt Schaefer. And I saw Matt today at, at uh, an event and he said he was planning on retiring uh, later this fall. Um, he'll be 65. And that'll be a loss because he's very knowledgeable um, on uh, Herbert Hoover. Oh, wow. And Shannon did put up the link in the chat for the tour of the Good. Lewis. Thank you. Building. Thank you, Shannon. And uh, Joe, do you want to, you want, oh, Joe, you found something. You want to tell us what you found here? It says. Yeah, I, I found a Des Moines Register article. It, it quoted the, the price in 82 as being in excess of 400000 That's cheaper than I thought it was, but maybe that was before the renewed interest. Joe comes up with the best things. <laughs> he, boom, got it. Ask and we, it shall be given. And uh, You have to see his latest TikTok, too. Oh, On yeah. the window, on the, on the memorial window. Good. Oh, great. Great, great, great. Paul, I have a question. Yes. You Maybe. mentioned you mentioned the Coney Bears. So, and I had put in the chat something about that I'm in touch with several of uh, Grant's cousins on the Weaver side. So I was looking through my messages back, you know, eight years ago or so, and one of them said, that they were second cousin to um, a Jean Boyd, whose mother was Jean Coney Bear. I wonder if that's the children of that, um, of Stella, what was it that you said in, that yeah, you I don't, mentioned? I don't have it right here, Debbie, but my notes are on the floor now. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> But what, um, was, what was significant about the Coney Bear family? I can't remember what you said. Well, they, um, they were cousins. Right. And uh, that was through Hattie's sister, right. uh, who, lived, who was living in uh, Cedar Rapids at that time. But my question has always been, and I've been by the Weaver house. It's there, not far from near Co, where Grant lived with Hattie for a while. My question has always been, there appeared to be money on the Weaver side of the family, and yet we find Hattie and her children without money for most of the time. And I just have always wondered what that was all about and why the Weavers' uh, brothers and, and uh, sisters couldn't have helped out um, Hattie a little bit, or nephews, nieces. Um, and not, I've, no one's ever given me an answer on that. Could be about the Quakers. Could be. Could be. Sometimes Quakers are like uh, Jewish folks. They, they might help you once. But if you're if you're not making it, that's it. They're, they're not going to help you anymore. And it could be the family dynamics uh, that went on between the siblings. Um, I'm not sure. And then didn't the grandpa die? The one yeah. that... Both the grandpa and the grandpa died. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Steve, you'll have to do a study for us on the um, the, the 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 spending habits of the different religious religions and the sub denominations. <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. I don't understand what that meant, Steve. Could you explain that? 
Um, as I understand it, and I, you know, being from Iowa, it's not that well known or uh, around here. But uh, my understanding is that Jewish folks sometimes will they'll help each other out, and if it doesn't work out, it's sort of like hard to get uh, get help the second time. They they distance themselves from failure, and that's what Quakers do the same. They they distance themselves from failure. You don't find uh, people that are financially failures as Quakers. They're just not there. They don't end up tend to be that way. And that's the way I understand. That's interesting. Now, I, I may be completely <laughs> wrong, but that's my understanding. Yeah. So we're, ten, we're, we're, we're kind of tread, tending into yeah. <laughs> some generalizations with, uh, it, yeah. with that. So I, I think that's probably... <laughs> yes. I'm going to try to... Uh, try to I'm going to try to distance our forum from generalizing too much. Um, Thank you. I would say that. Um, yeah, yeah, because my family is dotted with Quakers, and um, and and I, I I will tell you I have personal stories of of Quaker relatives opening lots of doors for lots of people different times. Now, I mean to your point there might be cultures within specific families or strains of yeah. places, you know, that, that may have some certain attitudes. Um, but uh, in, in any event, yes, the they wild wacky. They didn't approve of the marriage. I thought that was the crux of it. It seems kind of rudimentary, but they didn't approve of her marrying him is my understanding. That. That could be a peak. What do you think, Paul? Well, I, I'm i not sure um, how they felt about it. I, I'm not sure how the Wood family felt about it. Um, and they, they both had some strong feelings, but I'm not sure. Shannon's maybe read something that I haven't read. Well, getting back to the, I happen to have the book, Wanda Korn's book here. And it was uh, written in 1983. So you're right, it's right around the right, that same time that developed the interest in, in Grant Wood. When did you say the painting was sold? Uh, 82, I think. 82, so yeah. Yeah. They should have waited a year to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, time means everything, I would suppose. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, um, well, there, there are so many elements in that, in, in the painting, Paul, and I mean, just going down the rabbit hole with, I, I too kind of noticed that the depiction of the trees was a little different from some, you know, from the general impression that you get from his trees sometimes. There was a little diversity. In, in that element. I just found that just superficially interesting because some folks have been talking about the various, what the trees kind of kind of look like to them. So uh, I can't remember now in the chat who commented about some of the trees on the upper left even looking like they had kind of the Gothic arch to them. Is that you, Carla? Uh, no, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I, like, I like the uh, chickens and the oak leaves. Um, based on his childhood. I mean, he, he started out loving the chickens and uh, that was one of the first things he drew in school that brought recognition to him as 10 year old, that he had talent, that the kids turned around and said, whoa, look at this. And the other, uh, the Oak Leaves, that was his first prize. He, he won a prize, national prize for doing uh, Oak Leaf drawing uh, through a crayon company in New York. So those two things, you know, showing up in there just date back to his childhood and made me smile. <laughs> so what I'm seeing comment in the, in the, yeah, absolutely, Barbara. And uh, I'm seeing a comment in the um, chat about satirization in this painting. You know, do you have it? Any thought? Any more thoughts about what might be being satirized in the painting? Uh, it's it's possibly a satire on the fact that 
Hoover was presenting himself as being from very humble beginnings. And Grant was trying to show that uh, things didn't look like that anymore. Um, uh, he also, maybe with the empty streets, because there were seldom empty streets in 31, probably in mid-afternoon, maybe he sat satirizing that uh, the voters are gone now um, in 1931, um, because even Iowa didn't support him in the election of, of uh, 1932. Uh, so maybe the empty streets were some satire. Uh, there's so many things you could look at because there's so many elements to that image, I think. But those would be a couple of things that would come to my mind. And you know what's so okay, I want to jump in, Elaine, oh, real go quick. Ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Um, with Herbert Hoover, too, didn't he become very wealthy in China with his mining operations yeah. and stuff? Yes, he so did. He was super wealthy, so that makes sort of sense, too. I about think you're what right. You're, about you're, you're right, Barb. I, that's what I would feel too. The um, trying to look as if he's very poor when actually he's he's very rich at that time too. Um. Okay. Question. Um. Did Grant Wood and Herbert and Lou Hoover spend significant or even any time together after Hoover's presidency? I don't think they ever met personally. I've never read where they met. Okay. Um, okay, that's interesting. Um, oh darn, I had a thought and it went right out of my head. Um, oh yeah, it was, the, it was about all these things being relative. We look at that house right now and it may seem fairly modest, you know, in the scheme of things. Um, but back then it was, could have been considered a symbol of, of wealth or a, a different social class. But certainly a middle-class family would have lived in that house, or, or it would appear as if they would live in that house um, in I, 1931. Well, and I don't know about you, Paul, but I, I heard lots of stories growing up of people who had money, but it was really in poor taste to flaunt it and 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 you could define what flaunting is in different ways you know depending on where you were and what what was involved but um there were there was a lot of sensitivity to that which i think is what is maybe a fair bit different now in terms of just our general receptivity to you know what we what we see in public or what people display in public um i always found that an interesting di dynamic and 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 really is i think important to that era that that notion of modesty that notion of humility um i don't know if anybody else has any thoughts about that and i see a comment here that quakers especially conservative ones don't marry outside of the faith maybe that had something to do with wood's mother um, um, Elaine, just, I have Nan's book in front of me and just kind of wanted to, I, I know it's off topic with the Herbert Hoover house, but about the, the marriage. So, um, if you don't mind me reading no. it, um, okay. So after the minister pronounced Merville and Hattie, man and wife, father fainted. His brothers tossed cold water on him and off they went to the wood farm for a big reception and banquet in his honor. Not their honor, but his. Other sleighs filled with guests followed, but the bride and her family were not invited. When I asked mother about this story, she admitted that it was true, but she said she never meant to tell her children. How would you feel if you were the bride and were not invited to the wedding reception, she asked. Hurt as she was, she dearly loved Merval and tried to understand his family's actions. Father's two brothers and sisters, sister did not want him to marry. They planned that all the wood children should stay on the farm, work hard, acquire more land, pool their money, and eventually become extremely rich. None of father's siblings ever married, and his marriage was a great disappointment to them. 
Grandpa would, had died in 1884, and now the 30-year-old Merville was abandoning them. This left Uncle Clarence, who was 27, 29, Aunt Sally, who was 21, and Uncle Eugene, 15. So anyway, I think, you know, I don't know about the Weaver side, but in her book, she really mentions about it was the woods that were disappointed in the marriage. Oh, and that I, I think I had it reversed because I actually just pulled up the book, Nan's book too. Yeah. To figure out where I had read that. And it's it Grandpa. Yeah. And Grandpa and Grandma Weaver actually gave them their land, meaning Marville and um, Hattie gave them their land and an elegant parlor set, a set of furniture for the, the, the wedding gift. So they, they seem to be home. happy about it. Yeah, so they gave them their land, their home, and then it was the Weavers who helped them relocate to Cedar Rapids, I think. Um, so I, I got that reversed, maybe. Okay. Another couple stories that you might enjoy since we have a little time. And those of you that know me know I love these little stories about Iowa history, but um, Hoover ran against Al Smith, who was a Catholic. And at that time, 1928 in America, being a Catholic pretty much eliminated uh, you from a lot of people's minds in terms of an election. Um, but quite ironically, uh, Herbert Hoover and Lou Hoover had been married by a Catholic priest. Uh, and that was never really talked about. They were living in California and the nearest Protestant pastor was miles away at that time. Um, and Lou uh, had been teaching um, in a public school that had a fire. Uh, so the students were being taught in a parochial school that was in the same area. And they really liked the priest uh, who was in charge of this mission, mission school. So they asked him to uh, marry them. It wasn't a Catholic wedding. It was just a pronouncement of vows. And so, uh, although it was never promoted or never talked about much, um, they were married by a Catholic priest. The other story is, uh, and these were all when I did research on 1928, um, but uh, they, uh, Herbert Hoover made a speech that evening. And if any of you know uh, West Branch, uh, there's an area right in the middle of town they call the Rose Bowl. And that's where the high school plays their football games. So they put up two tents and it was a big affair. affair. Thousands of people came to West Branch to hear uh, Mr. Hoover speak. Well, after it was done, uh, of course, this tent was surrounded by uh, con concessionaires. And uh, one of the people selling chicken sandwiches uh, that day was a man named Duke Slater. And Duke Slater was in law school at that time at the University of Iowa. And quite recently, they named their football field the Duke Slater Field in Nile Kinnick Stadium. Uh, so just another uh, connection with a name some of you uh, probably recognize. Interesting. Well, welcome, Dorothy. <laughs> that time <laughs> difference is getting us now, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, glad to see you. Oh, goodness. I just got off the train. So, Paul, I'm sorry I missed it. I, I know it was great. I, you, you can see the video, Dorothy. <laughs> oh, and, oh, well, does anybody else have any other questions or comments or things they'd like to, to put out there? And one thing I, I do want to mention before this is all the series is all over and I'll send it out in emails too, is that um, definitely open to suggestions for future steps, future years, things people are interested in, would like to know more about, suggestions for any aspect of this forum. And so we're just, we're just an open kind of group here, uh, hoping to have fun every year and switch it up a little bit, keep the good stuff, try new things. So just wanted to put that out there as we're kind of coming to our last two sessions here. So Elaine, um, there's, there's a comment, Elaine, by, uh, uh, who is it there? 
All right. Um, well, check your uh, most recent comments. That looked pretty interesting. When, uh, yeah, Barb, you were talking about uh, being a drum major when when Herbert Hoover died. They had a parade in Westbury. Yeah, that's that's one. Barb Barb put that on, and yeah, it was my husband. He was the drum major. Uh -huh. they, they had some kind of parade, and he went to uh, Clarence high school and they, maybe there was multiple bands but he always has told me how he was part of that parade for Herbert Hoover after he passed away. What a and nice connection. A <laughs> what a nice connection Barb. That's great. That is nifty. And and we and we do know that Hoover went to Stanford. Yeah. All right. I've I've got something. Joe, um, bring it on. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's. I I think we should collectively thank uh, Barb Feller because last week she mentioned like, yeah, hey, I remember there was a film of Nan. I couldn't put my finger on it, but you know, I'm gonna look into it. And so um, I I work with the the folks at the the current folks at the History Center. So I reached out, and they said, what? That sounds great. So they got to digging and Tara Templeman, the curator, found it. And it has indeed been uh, digitized and it's on DVD. And it had a really strange uh, disclaimer on the front. It said it was produced by the Iowa Arts Council and uh, any use of it whatsoever needs to get clearance in whatever way and, and whatever. And so um, they reached out to the Iowa Arts Council and, you know, I, I guess they... People change, come and go. It's easy to forget what all their holdings are or whatever. So they kind of had to gather their ducks in a row and look into it. And then they uh, got back to the History Center this morning and said, yes, you have our permission. Please feel free, release it in whatever way you guys see fit. So um, they're figuring out if it's going to be just release it straight as it is. Or they asked me, I did their, their last documentary and... They wanted to know, Joe, after you see it, you know, should you kind of get interviews with historians and curators and kind of get more context into it, maybe something on the front and back end or whatever. So uh, we, we don't know yet, but uh, we're looking into it. I'm going to watch it uh, for the first time tomorrow. But this whole thing uh, kind of got rediscovered thanks to Barb. So thank you, Barb. Yay. Oh, thank you. For following bravo. This is so bravo, exciting. Bravo. Yeah. Do you know that what format it is or, or how long it is or anything about when it was made or anything like that? It was it was made in the 70s and it was of Nan Wood Graham being interviewed at Five Turner Alley. She was in Five Turner Alley and I I hardly remember. It was in very, very poor shape when I saw it. It was originally, what is it, 30 millimeter film? Is that what was the uh, original? I I think it was 16, but... Or, uh, yeah, I don't remember the number yet. But anyway, it was uh, it was in very poor shape, and we weren't sure if we'd be able to uh, repair it or restore it. And um, I was working... I, I started working at the... at the... Um, at Five Turner Alley around this time that I found this or just you know, it was just before I started working there or something, I had a connection with it. And I was sort of disappointed because we didn't really get to see very much of what what the uh, studio looked like at the time. We're just seeing Nan. Um, but I'm very, very excited because uh, the History Center kind of fell apart around this time. And I lost track of what happened with that film. I did get in touch with the person I'd given it to uh, and his wife, uh, he was the librarian at Coe College, and I knew that he knew about film restoration. And his wife works at the worked. I don't know if she still does um, at the historical at the history um, archives in Iowa City. So um, between the two of them, they they didn't remember what happened to it. But but Joe went right in and took over, and I'm so very pleased. <laughs> I hope we'll be able to share it. That's way, to, way to go, Joe. 
But you know, this is, what, this is what's so great about all of us talking together, I think, uh, because all of these ideas are mixed together by those of us that uh, really appreciate Grant Wood. And I think it's just wonderful. And all of your comments, I think, are wonderful to, to see. It's it's very yeah. exciting. And uh, a reminder to everyone, if you're not already, you can be a member of the History Center for a year. I, I think, uh, what is it, Paul, like $10? It's I, I'm a member, but I, I'm a member of a group of those, and I'm not sure, Joe. It's uh, it's pretty cheap, and uh, for those of us who like to dig into you know historical stuff, um, if you're in town, uh, just call ahead and see if it's a good time, and um, they they can turn you loose or they'll go get some things. It's cool; they have a secret kind of hidden place for you know safety reasons of uh, an entire floor full of old artifacts, and so uh, not everything is at the old Douglas Mansion right next mm -hmm. to Five Turner mm -hmm. Alley. So if you call ahead, maybe they can go get some stuff you're looking for, bring it to you, and just let you swim around in old documents and maps and stuff, and they're so helpful. Jason Wright is really doing a good job over there, kind of figuring out like what are some new ways we can bring in uh, interest in Lynn County history, but also bring in new revenue streams, but, you know, celebrate people who have been uh, off the radar. So they're they're doing a great job out there. I, I can't say enough about them. Um, I have something else to share if if there, if if there's time. Um, oh, but of course, Joe. <laughs> so this this is kind of crazy. I've already shared this with some of you guys. I'm going to share my screen. Um, in writing about Grant Wood over the years, uh, you know, I get emails from some people, some folks in this group, uh, this group, and it's always a great surprise to hear from somebody who's interested in what you've had published. And uh, there's a fellow in, in town, a retired banker, who uh, I did a, a big story on the Palmer method, that the Palmer company, and they taught much of America how to write cursive. And there's a very particular script and look and... Uh, Austin Palmer and his wife Sadie lived in Cedar Rapids and had this huge company. So it was a fun story to write about. Write about. Grant Wood did a series of uh, charcoal drawings for this company. Uh, Deb has a connection to uh, one of them. And uh, I'm in the process of kind of looking through all those old notes to do uh, a TikTok video on it. So um, anyway, this guy had reached out to me and he said, oh, retired banker here, by the way, you know, I kind of looked at a lot of stuff as it gets thrown away and decide whether it should be kept or not. And he came across Grant Wood's bank card with his legal signature on it that could be used in legal matters or whatever. And it's spit and image stock Palmer method handwriting. So it's that that's the, the signature you see on all the lithographs Palmer to the T because it, it's on his bank card. So, you know, that's kind of a, a, a neat element. And so uh, I guess he came across something else I did recently. So he reached out again the other day and he said, hey, Joe, by the way, uh, let me share something with you because uh, I forgot about it. And then I just remembered. He said before the flood in 2008, he was uh, rifling around in some of that bank stuff. And he came across some drawings that look like they're from done by Grant Wood of uh, the bank uh, that he worked for and maybe some other banks. Uh, Paul mentioned may, one of them could have been this uh, Sullivan Design Bank. Um, but he said he something told him I should take a picture of these in case anything ever happens. So he hmm. did. Then the flood happened and destroyed them. But then just recently he's like, oh yeah, I have those pictures. Let me reach out to Joe and see if he wants to dig in and do anything with them. So I'm gonna share my screen with you guys now. And uh, here are the shots. If you look really closely, you may recognize some if you do some history digging in the old city directories. Some of these were used in the ads in the city directories. Um, some of them you can see, this one is signed, it says Grant Wood. Uh, another one has a bit of a different Grant Wood type of signature at the bottom. But um, so here is a just a little treasure trove of stuff that maybe hasn't been seen in a while. And so I'm excited to dig in. And if any of you are interested or think you may have some leads, uh, reach out and let's let's do this thing together. There's a company in town called True Art that um, 
as the technology was developing to get better quality pictures in newspapers, uh, photo engravings uh, is how they do it, which is why prior to 1930, you, you really rarely saw good quality photographs because it takes a long time to, to, you know, make the engravings. So you'd see crude ones, little sketches of faces and stuff, but not a lot of photographs. Um, and I, I was talking to Paul about this. I think this is a big part of Grant Wood's story. Um, American Gothic, when it went huge and crazy, this technology had just came out. And newspapers were looking for ways to show off. You know, newspapers were very competitive. It wasn't, you know, rare for a town to have two or three papers trying to one-up each other. So if a paper invested in this technology and they could run great photos all of a sudden in the 30s, they would. And so the AP wire service and other services, um, they would say, here, here's a bunch of stuff for this weekend. You know, Art Institute of Chicago stuff, uh, this in Florida, this in Texas. And so these editors started running a lot of photos. And I think that's one of the ways, obviously Life Magazine and, uh, you know, um, being on display in various places. But I think that's one of the ways that kind of got into the zeitgeist uh, across the country. But True Art in Cedar Rapids is one of these companies that did a lot of these engravings. And so you'll see that at the bottom of some of these, uh, yeah, it's, if you look really closely, it says true art. They have a couple different marks that they used. So there's some digging into about true art, that company, um, what was its role? Did it hire Grant Wood or did the bank hire Grant Wood? Um, so there's a lot to dig into there and I'm really curious about it, but I knew I just had to share that with you guys. Uh, I, I knew you guys would think that was pretty cool too. Thank you so much, Joe. That's like feels like the tip of a of a nifty iceberg right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we do have somebody who would love for you to share your link to your latest TikTok. Um, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> we could actually put that on the program for for next Monday if you'd like to share it. Okay, that sure. might be nice to put it on the program. It would be okay to do that, and uh, then and then absolutely. share share it then. Okay, that sounds like a, a winner. Um, I have one little story, very personal, that I have to add to this conversation and then I'll let you go. Um, I met my husband because of Palmer method of handwriting. Oh, really? <laughs> when, I was in, when I was in um, eighth grade, well, when I was in seventh grade, I moved to a school in New York, in, in Utica, New York. and um, they did Palmer method of handwriting, but I had never done Palmer method of handwriting. So I was forced to stay after school. I got an F on my report card. It was horrible um, in handwriting. And so I was forced to stay after school and then be with this one young man who um, also, he had been there the whole time, but his writing was terrible and still is. And it's not my husband, but he uh, is, his mother and my husband's mother were best friends. My husband was living in New York City. This guy was living in Utica. And he eventually, uh, we became great friends. We dated each other in eighth grade. He invited me to his bar mitzvah. And I met my husband originally at his bar mitzvah. And it was because the two of us had to sit next to each other after school and practice Palmer method of writing. So I was pretty thrilled to find out Palmer was in Cedar Rapids when I moved here. And we're going to see this friend for the first time in a couple of years um, this weekend. So it's kind of cool. Kind of cool. <laughs> Thank that you. was so charming. <laughs> I mean, it really is Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> These riv it, We have rivulets. We do. You know, we do. And in, this is a in wonderful this forum. Group. Things just keep yeah. going and going somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Well, boy, we've kept everybody after eight o'clock. I should probably let everybody go. And please expect an email um, this week about in preparation of, of our details and things. And you may also get one from Meredith at the library as well, which is what they do. And they haven't missed one yet. So appreciate that. And we do and, want your links, Joe. Definitely. Thank you. Yes, yes. And we'll, we'll watch it and link it next week for sure. And those of you who have something that you would like to contribute next week, please email me and let me know. Um, 
if you don't get me emailed, the sky's not going to fall. We'll try to figure out to get you on the program. We don't have to be real, real, um, rig you know, that rigorous about it. But, um, but it would be helpful so that we kind of have a sense of things and, and, and space things out. So um, happy, happy collaborating. You know, we, who knows what's going on between these weeks that we meet. <laughs> We find out bits and pieces when we're back together and it's so fun. And uh, so I, so let's just enjoy this next week, knowing that next week we'll bask in the glow of some of the things that we've created together, share together, put out there and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you so much, everybody.